introduction because I want to make sure Brother Given has plenty of time to present and develop the things that he has. And so I'm just going to make a couple of real summary remarks and kind of like an overview. We have been lifted up into the heavenlies. We've tasted of the word of God and of the powers of the world to come. We have fellowship. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We have things that people before Christ couldn't even begin to imagine. Now, Brother Given's message, how do you turn then to the weak and beggarly elements? This is written to the saints, not to sinners outside. These are the people who have entered into at least a beginning sense, if not to, to some extent, the things that have been given to us. And the... The world and the earth cannot and it will not preserve us. It couldn't bring us in. It can't perfect us. Amen. So for when we talk about these weak and beggarly things, we're not talking about turning back into sin. Although, if we refuse the things that are in Christ, we will, by default, pull back into perdition. This is a very serious thing. This is, this is not something to be trifled with or taken lightly. The consequences of this are grave to us, and they're a reproach to the Lord we serve. So uh, I'm going to just stop there before I get accused of preaching my sermon and uh, have Brother Given come up and, and uh, present this more fully. The text has been read for you, and it's a it's an important text. I want to I want to read it again. I know it without reading without reading it, but there's something about reading it. Yes, amen. But now. <clears throat> I say, but now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire to be in bondage? Now that question is intended to be answered. It's not a, just a rhetorical question. It is not. The churches, these were, there wasn't a church of Galatia. The epistle was written to the churches of Galatia. So the churches of Galatia were among some of the worst churches in the first century. And unfortunately, some people have restored that church. Another one of the bad churches of the first century was the Corinthian assembly. They were... Galatia, they, they, they left, they left God who called them into the grace of Christ. They left him. That's what Galatians 1, 6 says. They left God <laughs> who called them into the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the Corinthians, they were carnal. Paul said, I couldn't even talk to you like spiritual. Today, which I couldn't talk to you like you're Christians. You I mean you're acting like the world? You're like the world. You're just carnal. In both those cases, they all had a good start. Yes. yes. See, nobody starts out deficient in Christ. Yeah. Well, I want to nail this down now. Nobody starts out deficient in Christ. Everybody's put into Christ. Everybody's raised up to sit together with Christ in heavenly places. Everybody has access to God. Everybody can obtain grace, mercy, and find grace to help in a time of need. Everybody's been redeemed. Everybody's sins have been forgiven. Everybody starts out with a clean slate and in the right place. Everybody. And if someone doesn't start out that way, they didn't get in. Not just... Someone's got to just come out and say it. Amen. There's all kind of church people never got in. There's a lot of them got in and someone lured them out. Yeah. 
When you come into Christ, you come in a babe. Nobody comes in an adult. <laughs> you come in a babe. And just on the edge, you're just on the edge of the promised land. Like when Israel entered in, they entered Jericho, like it's right on the Jordan. <laughs> it's right on the Jordan River, right at the edge. That's where you were when you come in. You're on the edge. And you got to Now your life is negotiating through this tremendous circle. It's, you start on the edge. You're it's to end up at the other end, ever with the Lord. That that's what that's <laughs> that's what the church is for. The church is not primarily to get you in. I dedicate this to the Great Commission people, of which I once I once was in that camp. I said that's the main thing. I don't know who dubbed. Matthew 28 and Mark 16, the Great Commission. I don't know who did this. I don't know why they didn't say, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God. I, yeah. Why isn't that the Great Commission? Yeah. Right? In fact, there's a lot of Great Commissions. Now, this, this situation that ex existed in Galatia, it took a lot to get them in because they came from a these were like not, not Jews. They came from a heathen background. Mm -hmm. But they, they settled down mm -hmm. at the edge. See, Jerusalem was, was at the heart of Canaan. It wasn't, it wasn't on the border. That's not where Jerusalem was. It was in the heart, right there in the heart of the land. But these Galatians settled down out here at the periphery of the kingdom, close to the world, and so people in the world that wanted to capitalize on people in religion, see they were they had access to these these people. Why did you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements? Which means that they had done this. Now our text says now after that you have known God, comma. Now, I think he's more precise. Let's be more precise about this. You knowing God isn't really the main thing. Is it, or rather, are known by God. Yeah, that's the main thing. I mean, you've got to know God. But the main thing is, does God know you? Amen. Not does God know about you. He knows about everybody. Does he know, does he have concourse with you? Is he involved with you? Is there come a, come kind of exchange going on between you and God? After you knew God, or rather known by God, how did you turn to weak and beggarly elements? So let's have, have a little definitions of words here. I'm not big on defining words, but these words need to be defined. Weak means poor and powerless, unable, unimpressive, that, see, that, that doesn't characterize any part of salvation. Yeah. Not the beginning, not the middle, not the end. There's nothing about Jesus, nothing about salvation, nothing about the new covenant that is weak. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing about newness of life that's weak. Yeah. Beggarly. That means it's worthless, miserable, feeble, destitute, useless, pitiful, Nothing about Jesus is useless. Nothing about salvation is useless. Nothing about the Holy Spirit is useless. Nothing about reconciliation is useless. Nothing about the new creation is useless. Useless is all on the devil's side of the equation, not on God's side at all. What's elements? We'd say elementary. That's how we'd, we'd say it. the ABCs. Now, see, in the world, all learning is from the bottom up. That's how, that's in the world, this is how you learn. You start with the ABCs, and you learn words, and you learn sentences. But this is not how you learn in the kingdom. And the kingdom is top-down learning. You learn the big stuff first. Yeah. I just have to just trace through Scripture to where, where people preach to this sort of thing, and you'll find they talk about the big stuff. Nobody told people how to live in the initial sermon. I mean, 
but you just have to confirm by your own research that this is what I'm telling you is the truth. You start at the top. What's to be preached primarily are the fundamental realities, the pillars that support the temple. That's what's supposed to be preached primarily. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. That's these pillars. Solomon's temple had two big pillars held the whole thing up. And there's pillars of reality that hold up. That's what's to be preached. The things that don't vary. The things that are absolutely dependable and unshakable. Elements are ABC things. They're principles. In Scripture, there were ceremonies. Under the law, the law was a system of rudiments, the ceremonial law in particular. God told people how to live. Every seventh day, God told you what to do. This is what you do on the seventh day. On the seventh year, this is what you do on the seventh year. On the fiftieth year, this is what you do on the fiftieth year. You seamstresses, here's how you sew. You don't mingle the thread. Those are farmers that plow, here's how you plow. You don't plow with an ox and an ass. You don't use mingled seeds. He told them everything to do. Here's what you can eat. Here's what you can't eat. Here's what you can touch. Here's what you can't touch. And ladies, after you have a baby, here's a routine you have to go through. It takes about 40 days to get through it. Here's what you got to do. A, B, C, D, spell it all out every, every little step. That's not what you have in Christ. And that's the saying that we've been freed. We've been freed from that. <clears throat> Now, as I mentioned, under the law, the law stood in meats. This is Hebrews 9, 9, and 10. The law stood in meats and drinks and diverse washings and ordinances. It was a, the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law was a living out of the Ten Commandments. The people didn't know what the Ten Commandments meant, really. You know what they meant, so God had to tell them what they meant. Love God, that means when my day comes, your day shuts down. In fact, the prophets taught, don't do your pleasure. God said, don't do your pleasure on my day. Woo, that revolutionized church gathering right there. He told them, this is, this is how they lived under the law. I mean, it's one workshop after another. Yeah, that's, 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 the law was workshop religion. They had to tell people how, when, where, what. That's the elementary rudiments. Why? After you knew God, and after you come into this tremendous freedom, why are you going back to a rule-oriented religion? With them, it started with circumcision. They got in the door with circumcision. Now, you cannot go to the Bible and prove that circumcision ceased. That's right. But it did, as an ordinance, it did. The teaching leads you to that conclusion. There's a difference. It's been, it's been overshadowed by a greater circumcision. Now, see... I come from a movement that had a lot of trouble with the Sabbath day commandment. So they constructed a religion like this. They said what God did, he erased the law. He just erased the law. And then he repromulged the commandments he wanted to be on the other side too. The only reason they did that, the only reason they did that was that Sabbath commandment. They couldn't get around it. But the Sabbath commandment was never obviated. It was overshadowed by a greater glory. The Sabbath was the only kind of rest Israel could have. But we which believe do enter into rest and cease from our own labor. So that rest was a greater glory that overshadowed the Sabbath glory. That's, how, that's why it's not enforced anymore. 
It's a greater. Rudiments. Living by rote. Living by system or methodology rather than by God. See, now in Christ, there's power. God has given us the spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Everybody gets this when they come into Christ. Yeah. Rudiments brush that aside. You can't figure out how to do it, so we'll tell you how to do it. Yeah. All God tells the husbands to do is love your wife. Mm -hmm. He doesn't tell them how to do it. Yeah. But men try and tell them how to do it. Yeah. Don't they? Yeah. I once years ago when I was, wasn't as, didn't have as much finesse as I got now, <laughs> I held a seminar on marriage. And I said, now this seminar, I'm going to take five minutes and read to you everything God has said about marriage. Take me about five minutes. And I read it, I said, now, is there really someone here that doesn't understand that? Is there? You just do what God said. Yeah. See, it's hard. Then you gotta have, find some mercy and grace to help in a time of need, but it can be done or God Amen. wouldn't say to do it. He didn't say, love your wife if you can. Yeah. Now, I want to establish this point that Jesus has delivered us from that kind of religion, yeah. the how-to religion. He's delivered us from that. Amen. The statement is made in 1 Peter 1, 18. For as much as you know, this is common knowledge now, much as ye know, you were redeemed, not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from, redeemed from, your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. What's he talking about? He's talking about the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law taught you how to live. It did to you how to live, but Jesus has redeemed you from. And what, what did it produce? What did it produce? After 2,500, after 1,500 years of law, the administration of law, what had it produced? Not one single person that was flawless. Not one. What it did, it kept sin in check. It kept it from just, you know, exploding out. In, and the way it did it, it killed you. <laughs> but through fear of death, we're all a lifetime subject to bondage. What kind of bondage? The law made people do what they didn't want to do. Yeah. And if you didn't do it, the penalty was die. That's the way it went. Through fear of death, we're all the lifetime subject to bondage. The law taught you to be scared to sin. Now, some people didn't get the message, so we got plagues. and Sometimes he'd wipe out 30,000 people, just, just wipe them out. Because if he didn't do that, then sin would spread those exponentially. All right, now, we've been freed from that kind of a system. We've been freed... From vain conversation means manner of life. Your life is like a conversation. Yeah. It's like a long speech. And, and you, your life is pointless. Out of Christ, I, your life is just a waste of time. Yeah. Nobody's better because you're here if you're out of Christ. You're just filling up space. That's all it amounts to. Amen. Vain living. Unfortunately... A lot of people who profess to be Christians are leading pointless, aimless lives. Amen. They aren't pointed anywhere that is of any value. Yeah. Yeah. Why? It's their religion has made them what they are. That's why. God has voided this methodology of controlling people. 
If God can't control you, Satan's going to control you. It doesn't make any difference what kind of laws you impose on them. It doesn't make any difference. Maybe you can impose some laws and make them do this or that, but Satan's going to control them. Because there's really only two masters. That's really all there are. God or Satan. By nature, you default to Satan. Then Jesus delivers you. But he not only delivers you from Satan, he delivers you into the hands of Christ. And Christ doesn't need these things to direct you. You can be directed from within. You can. <laughs> now the logic of living by rote, why, why did people live by rote? Well, you can't harness the flesh. <laughs> and flesh can't be taught. You can't teach the flesh. There's nothing inherent by nature, in man by nature, that equips him to comprehend the things of God. He doesn't have anything when he's born. He doesn't have any capacity, any ability to comprehend the things of God. Why? Man's knowledge or his ability to grasp something cannot extend beyond the circumference of human experience. Man can't think, act, or do beyond the circumference of human experience. The law talked about God. He's beyond human experience. He's outside the circumference of human experience. You can't comprehend God by smelling or seeing or hearing or tasting. Or t you, or you can't find God out that way. Now think of what you come into. When you come in, into Christ, think of the things that you come in contact with now. There's an eternal God. Deuteronomy 33, 27. There's eternal life. John 3.15, there's eternal power, Romans 1.20. There's an eternal weight of glory, 2 Corinthians 4.17. There's an eternal purpose, Ephesians 3.11. There's eternal glory, 2 Timothy 2.10. There's eternal salvation, Hebrews 5.9. Eternal judgment, Hebrews 6.2. Eternal redemption, Hebrews 9.12. Eternal spirit. Hebrews 9.14, eternal inheritance, Hebrews 9.15, eternal fire, Jude 1.7. Yeah. None of those things can be comprehended by the natural mind yeah. because they're beyond yeah. human experience. You can't parallel that with anything. There's nothing in the creation that parallels those things, and yet that's what you've got to deal with. There's no kind of regimented thinking that will enable you to understand those things. There's no, there's no lexicon or commentary or dictionary that can enable you to comprehend what those things are about. They're beyond the scope of human knowledge. Now, the closer you are to the temporal, the further you are from the eternal. And... The closer you are to the eternal, the further you are from the temporal. Why does the world appeal to people, religious people? Because they're close to it. That's why they're close to it. They don't realize they've been liberated from living that way. See, you've got to have rules for people that are living on the, close to the world. You've got to have rules to kind of control them. If you can get them into the heart, they'll be saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? Yeah. Yeah. They won't say, what do I have to do, Lord? What, what's the least I can do and be saved? That's what I want to know. People don't come out and say that, but that's what they mean. Yeah. Do I really have to be baptized? I said, no, you don't have to be baptized. You like can go to hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Am I right or not? Nobody in Scripture ever tried to talk someone into being baptized. In fact, John refused to baptize some people. He said, well, you generation of vipers, who told you to flee from the wrath to come? Produce some fruits, meat for repentance. You've got to prove to me you've repented before I'll do anything. 
And incidentally, Paul said in Acts 26 that he preached the same thing long after that. He preached that men should bring forth fruits, meet for, should turn to God and bring forth fruits, meet for repentance. When you're, when you're seeking to win souls, you better make sure when you want them that they've proved that they really meant business. Amen. Now the, the ceremonial law, which is the particular rudiments we're talking about, elementary things, there are two phrases in scripture that refer to the ceremonial law in this manner. <laughs> For some time I, I was taught that the law itself, the Ten Commandments, is blotted out. It's a scripture never says that. That I was taught that. What it says is blotted out was the law of commandments. This is uh, Ephesians 2.15. The law of commandments contained in ordinances. Contained in ordinances. Colossians 2.14 says they handwritten ordinances. The ordinances were the building on what the law said. It told you how to do what the law said. That was the rudiments. That was the rudiments. How do you love God? Told you, told you how to love God. When I say three times a day all the men empty out and meet at a place where I tell you and don't come empty, that's what you had to do. He said, yeah, but the women and children are all going to be left alone. He says, well, I'm going to make sure nobody wants to take them. He had to do what God said when he said to do it. He, he didn't take, tell you to think about it. See, if it's reasonable, you just had to do it. Don't touch the ark. That's what he meant. Because I found out. That's what he meant. Those are rudiments. This is how you teach your little children with rudiments. Don't do this. Don't touch the hot stove. Don't run in the road. Don't. But when they're 25 years old and you're saying that, you say, well, we got some problem here. Yeah. You aren't 25-year-old Christians that this is what they're being told. Oh, you shouldn't go to shows. Shouldn't play cards. Now, I'm not advocating any of those things. I'm just saying you got to have a bigger reason to cease from those things. Amen. The law was imposed, wasn't negotiated. Hebrews 9.10 tells you that. Which stood, the law which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal or outward ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. The reforming of things take place in Christ. All right, now let's briefly look at what, ha what has happened in Christ. Remember, Peter said we've been redeemed from a pointless way of living, received by tradition from our fathers. We've been, we, you're not, you owe no obligation to that anymore. What has happened in Christ? Well, for one thing, you've been born again of incorruptible seed, 1 Peter 1, 23. Those in Christ are a new creation. They're a new kind of person. Mm -hmm. Amen. Old things pass away. All things become new. That's 2 Corinthians 5.17. When you come into Christ, when you're baptized, the old man, the part of you that's not going to get in, was crucified. Romans 6.6. 6. Our old man was crucified. Who crucified him? God crucified him for you mm -hmm. when you were baptized. Yeah. He was put in a position where he could not do anything. He was like that thief, those thieves on the cross. <laughs> they couldn't do anything oh, but talk, that's all. Your job is to keep him crucified. Yeah. The manner of death in scripture is crucifixion, a slow, drawn out death, but it's sure. When you come into Christ, you, you received a new man that's to be put on. You're to turn the government of your life over to the, quote, new man. The part that's created in Christ Jesus. He's to run your life. That's it. And you're to put off 
the old man and refuse to let the unredeemed part of you to let it dictate. Amen. You experience this. God wrote his law upon your heart and put it in your mind. He said he was going to do this and he did this. This doesn't mean that you woke up in the morning and you could quote Romans. I mean, that's not what it means. What it means is when you hear Romans, you say, I can see that's the truth. You recognize the truth when it's written on your heart. You're in agreement with it, in other words. He's, he's, he's made you have an affinity with truth. Of course, if you want to live close to the world, and you forfeit all that. He gave you the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 4, 8 says, he, give, he hath given us of his own spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. Actually, the whole God has living in you. John said, whoever loves God... He dwells in God, and God dwells in him. Christ dwells in your heart by faith, and the Holy Spirit dwells in you. So there's a whole God. I mean, how much advantage, how much advantage do you want? Amen. You see why you, you've been liberated yes. from the elemental spirits? Mm -hmm. And you've also, Jesus has come and is teaching you. Giving you an understanding of God. That's First John 5.20. Because knowing God is eternal life. You're just as alive as much as you know God. And Jesus is there to make sure you know God. You understand him. You know a lot about who you, who you really know. And like I, I know Sister June. She knows me. I could, you could ask me questions about Sister June and I could answer them. Yeah, what kind of food she like? Well, I can tell you. What's your favorite color? I can tell you. Did she get tired easy? I can tell you. Why? Because I know her. When you know God and someone asks you about God, there's things about him you can tell. We all know God. We have access to God with confidence. That's Ephesians 3.12. And we're being changed... This is an ongoing work. We're being changed from one increasing stage of glory to another by the Holy Spirit. That's 2 Corinthians 3.18. And he changes us while we're beholding the glory of the Lord. While we're looking at Christ, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit's shaping us up. Amen. Just like Jesus. And we're called into fellowship with the Son. All right, now, what is there about those things that is deficient? What is there about that, that kind of thing? I just named a few of the things. What is there about that that would make it necessary for some addendum, some extra tip from somebody? How dare you encroach on God's territory? Don't you dare take in your hand to do something Jesus is doing and the Spirit's doing and God is doing. They can do it. You can't do it. As far as shaping someone else's life. You can't do it. So now the question is, why did you go back to the weak and beggarly elements? Why did you submit to be governed by a routine. Why did you do that? See, there's moral power and spiritual power in Christ. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. There's a capacity in Christ that you can grow to the point you can discern good and evil. And until you're not going to be able to avoid it until you can discern it. Because evil is too big a category for people to be able to finally define it. You've learned that already, haven't you? That in Christ, there's things that you see as sin. No, you didn't used to see as sin. Like the plowing of the wicked is sin. How about that? The thought of foolishness is sin. See, so sin is a... We've got to have some help in defining that. And you can get wisdom and spiritual understanding from God. Paul prayed for the church that he might give you the spirit of wisdom and spiritual understanding. That can come from God. You can't teach that in some course. Amen. I mean, I've tried. I, I, I bought into that for a while. 
It wasn't working, everybody knew it. Everybody knew it wasn't working, that's why you had to have the workshop again next year. Yeah. It didn't work. Yeah. I learned that in the, in, the, in the manufacturing world, we used to have all these, uh, up until 1980, you didn't have anything like this, but after 1980, they began to have workshops on how-to things and how-to, you get all hyped up over it, you know. Get your diary out and get your notebook out. And, but after about two weeks, it was Dullsville. Yeah. <clears throat> and it wore off and nobody wanted to do it. But when you come into Christ, it's not that way. Yeah, right. The love of Christ constrains us. Because we thus judge if one died for all, then all dead, and they which live should not henceforth from now on live unto themselves, but unto him which loved them and gave himself for them. You see, it's a different principle entirely. It's God has proved over a period of 4,000 years, 2,500 years without law, 1,500 years with law, he has proved that you can't live by rules. That's been proved. Do I have repented of, of my effort to promote that? <laughs> I'm, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. I was, I'm ashamed I did it. I just was listening to the wrong people. So we've been delivered from vain tradition, received, vain living received by tradition from our fathers. There's no need to return to weak and beggarly elements. You got the best to everything in Christ Jesus. Capitalize on it, brethren. Capitalize upon it. You test it out. Prove God. See, you test this out and see if it's not true. See if you can trust God and be disappointed. You see if you can. He that believes on me, the Lord said, will not be disappointed. Amen.